what's been going on in Belgium. But today I want to go for, further because Psalm 1 begins with a beatitude. It could have started with a prayer or a song. It could have started with an instruction or a rule, but it begins with a blessing. And the word beatitude means perfect happiness. I'm not talking about fake, pasty, smile. I'm in church, so I'm just going to smile. Everything is great. No, but perfect happiness, joy, peace, and satisfaction deep in, the, deep in our being. And apparently, this type of deep happiness has to do with how we live and who we are, not just what we do. Because Psalm 1 starts with a statement about human existence. And the themes in this psalm carry over to all 150 psalms. And the whole book means psalms. That's what the word psalm means. So apparently, according to this, how life is lived is very, very influential on how it's going to turn out. So I was thinking about this. We could call the psalms the guide to the happiest life, or the manual to the happiest life. So what's it going to tell us? Well, if it's like what we normally hear, it's going to give us a 1-800 number for how to find knives that can cut their steel. Or maybe it'll tell us how to get rich in 20 days. Or how to lose weight without changing a thing in our, in our lifestyle so that we can feel beautiful and sexy. Then we'll be happy. Or it'll tell us how we need a new car, just like the neighbor got. Or that marriage and sex will solve all our problems. Or that if I can only get pregnant, then maybe my husband will stay with me. Or if I could eat this chocolate sundae with whipped cream and nuts just this once, and if I let myself indulge, I won't be depressed anymore. Or if I can get to the top of the corporate ladder, I'm going to go for CEO, then I will be satisfied. It might tell us that beauty and money and power and sex are the only things that will make us happy, while old-fashioned traits like character and faithfulness, integrity and honesty are boring and way outdated, right? Well, let's see. Let's turn to Psalm 1, and I'm going to read it in a different version. Uh, or has it even been read yet? No, I'm thinking of the last service. Okay, so I'm going to read it in the... Uh, the Revised Standard Version, and here it is. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. And they'll keep going. They're, they're like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prosper. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will be destroyed. So all it takes to be happy, if I get this right, is to uh, avoid bad people and read the Bible. Uh, let's unpack that. There are two parts. Choose your friends wisely and get into God's word. And you can see that right in the first few verses. So first, check your friends. Who are you hanging out with? Who do you spend time with? And more importantly, much more importantly, how do you spend that time? Who is influencing whom? It says, happy are those who don't follow the advice of the wicked or take the path the sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. So who are the wicked, sinners, and scoffers? First, we need to realize that the words wicked and righteous are a word pair that's used for teaching. The author's not trying to imply that there's some absolute moral righteousness or absolute wickedness taking place. No human being is 100% evil or 100% good. We try to, you know, once we get mad at someone, we try to make them all evil in our heads, if you're like me. But they're not, they won't be, because all humans have been made in the image of God. But only some are aware of this and trying to participate with God in order to act as they were truly meant to be, truly created. So it's not this us and them thing. I don't. I want us to read this like, oh yeah, let's. We're the righteous and they're the wicked. Ha ha, we're righteous. No. Um, <laughs> it's a question about God. It's a theological issue. Life is either in the right with God, or it's not. There's no partly righteous. There's no a little bit wicked. 
Either one is striving to be a healthy tree, or they're not. There's no in-between. And as I like to say it, faith is like swimming upstream. As soon as you stop kicking, as soon as you stop trying, you go backwards. You move in the opposite direction. There's no such thing as a stagnant faith walk. There's no such thing as a healthy tree that just maintains. Either the roots are pumping in nutrients and H2O, or the tree is dying. So another way of asking it is, is our life purpose, our life performance confirm, does this confirm or deny that there's a sovereign deity that exists in the world? What directs life? Because that answer will determine if a person is wicked or righteous. Are we concerned with and searching for a revelation from the living God? Or are we concerned with and searching for number one, me and my selfish desires? That being said, the word for righteous and or for wicked in Hebrew is those who are actively seeking evil. It's not that they do things that aren't in line with loving God and loving your neighbor once in a while. It's that their entire lifestyle is based on deceit. And so it's not someone that is going to mess up and repent and go back to God. It's someone that's choosing to live apart from God, actively embracing a lifestyle apart from the source, apart from the stream of living water. And then there's a progression with these verbs. If we look at the verbs walk, stand, and sit, you can see that there's a progression there. One starts kind of far away and one gets real comfortable. So let's not walk in the counsel of the wicked. In other words, let's not walk with the teachings that are incongruent with loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And then don't stand, so that, that's someone who's going to stop, don't stand in the way of sinners. Let's not plop ourselves down and become like those who are no longer seeking God's ways. And then don't sit, don't get really comfortable in the seat of mockers. Let's not join in with the voices around us that mock a relationship with God as being something for weak people or something for powerless people. So the gist is, let's not be so influenced by all the ways society tries to tell us to live. But it's not saying, please don't understand this, it's not saying go lock yourself up in a commune, go join a ghetto, and get far away from people who don't believe in God. Jesus would never do this. Jesus ate with sinners. He just didn't follow their way. And he actually hung out with them a lot more than he hung out with the